Oh, gee whiz. What have we got here? It's the Moon Man S2. Isn't it gorgeous? Isn't it beautiful? The substance of it is so smooth. I want to kiss it. It's got this wonderful kind of helter-skelter polish to it. Either finial has a flat silver coin gleaming out at you. The acrylic is just beautiful. It's slightly opaque translucent in places. I, I can see the ink in the cartridge converter inside the shaft. The cap band is nice and simple, elegant, just the brand name, Moon Man in nice spaced out uppercase lettering. The shape is reminiscent of the Pen BBS 323, but the sweep of it is even more extravagant. You have this bulge where the cap band meets the shaft and then it swoops down, 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 down and then does this dainty little outward turn curtsy type thing at the lower finial, which is, well, cute. So with this acrylic that feels so nice in the hand and with it looking so pretty and this waving swoop of a profile, it's clear they've gone to town on the visuals with this pen. But is it more style over substance? Let's find out in today's Panda Pen Club Fountain Pen Review. Does anyone read a picture book from the beginning? I don't. The eye has to travel. Yes, but to what end? Or is that the sort of question to, to send us, or, or perhaps me exclusively, completely barking mad? Possibly. The fabulous Mrs. Freeland is obviously making the point that if you want people's devoted attention, you've got to draw the eye and bring it along for a ride of some description. You've got to tell a story. You've got to give them something kinetic to hook onto. I mentioned Diana Vreeland because, <laughs> Well, she's, she's never far from my mind. But my excuse for mentioning her in the context of the S2 and its striking S shape is this idea of drawing the eye of the viewer and contriving this basic human response that Mrs. Vreeland described. In 1753, the painter, cartoonist and satirical giant, monumental trailblazer of the storyboard, William Hogarth, published The Analysis of Beauty. Here, he pinpointed this S-shaped serpentine line, what he called the line of beauty, also known as an OG, as being a fundamental factor in anything visually pleasing, in nature, in shells and flowers, all of which affords an infinite choice of elegant hints. Similarly, you'll find the S2 is, is quite clearly a koi carp inspired pen. The packaging is emblazoned with this fishy source of inspiration and it, it, it's rather gorgeously done, the box. I mean, in fact, the box is, is <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. And just to give you an indication of how ridiculous it is and how ridiculous it makes one act, I, I bought this pen ages and ages ago while I was in China. And then I had some things shipped back at vast expense um, last year. And I included this box in my shipment, which is nuts, actually. <laughs> you can get this pen right now on AliExpress for $33 without the box. With the box, it's $68. You get the pen too. They throw in the pen, I think. I mean, it's really nice. It's red. It has a little little string here, a little handle. And you've got these, these rather pretty pictures inside, with scales and fishes. And, and there's a little indent for the pen with the matching springy string. And you've got a bottle of Pen BBS ink. Mine is Qingqiu, which 
possibly refers to a city in Shandong province, or you could maybe translate the characters as something like green hummock, which I rather like, even though the ink is certainly not green. You'll see that shortly. I already mentioned it's very similar to the Pen BBS 323, quite similar as well in general bulk to the Duke Charlie Chaplin, which I have also reviewed. I'd say the S2 is, on initial inspection, more beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous. Why is it gorgeous? Well, Hogarth would explain this to us via his wandering, weaving, waving line of beauty, which creates or signals beauty because it leads the eye in a pleasing manner along the continuity of its variety. And this wasn't just... <laughs> This wasn't just an idea Hogarth plucked out of his uh, out of nowhere. It was derived from his fairly considerable experience with wowing the public in the realm of the visual arts. He'd become known in particular for his pioneering, very popular and influential series of paintings and engravings called Modern Moral Subjects, which is a thunderous title. These were unusually affecting in their indecorous, humorous, in your face, here's a slice of life <laughs> qualities. <laughs> Charles Lamb, slightly more restrained person, called them teeming, fruitful, suggestive. Other pictures we look at, his pictures we read. Why? One of Hogarth's best known works was A Harlot's Progress, which was produced around 1731. You can see this, this lady in her sort of boudoir, and there's a, there's a cat poised to leap on something under the bed. There's a witch's hat and, and, a, and a bundle of birch twigs on the wall. She's holding a watch, suggesting maybe the passage of time. Time is nearly up. There's a box, possibly hidden on top of the bed, and it, say, say, it says on it, James Dalton's wig box. <laughs> Who's she hiding the wig box from? I'm not sure what that, that tentacled object hanging on the back wall there is. Ah, uh, but if, if you, if you here on the right, you've got these rough housing officials blundering in without knocking, which the whole thing looks like a, well, something that's about to become a nightmare. Similarly, a year later, you have A Rake's Progress, a series of eight paintings and engravings that chronicle the rise and fall of the heir, who's the son of a rich merchant who comes to London, lives the high life, and ends up in Bethlehem Royal Hospital, better known as the notorious Bedlam Asylum. Each plate in the series suggests a moment of tension that's about to snap. The, there's a promise of a ruckus, which a change in, in the hero's circumstances. This one, known as the tavern scene, or the orgy, is a particularly good one to look at for this quality. There's so much going on here, but if you zoom in to the back, You'll see one of the things that's about to rupture the status quo in this one. The uh-oh moment. One of the ladies there is somewhat heinously squirting a mouthful of, presumably, gin at one of her confrères on the other side of that lovely table. If she intends this as some sort of frolicking prank or a little sort of jape, something's gone wrong because her buddy over there is looking very, very cross about the whole situation, she's brandishing a curvy little mini scimitar. That's, that's, that's a joke that hasn't landed when somebody gets a scimitar out. <laughs> what I really want to emphasise here though are the lines. The lines that both the stream of gin and the blade make. These lines, they draw the eye along their kind of supple contours, but at the same time they suggest a moment that's held, a sort of moment suspended with the bulk of the past, the body of the future, and, and just the crest, the elegant crest of now. But you know, I'm really only envious of one thing, and that is a surfer. I think it's the most beautiful thing. See, I'm mad about water. I think water is God's tranquilizer. But there's something really awkward, and possibly a bit depressing, 
about this whole concept for me, or there was initially. There's, there's this line, right? And the artist uses it to draw the eye, draw in the viewer. But was it drawn because, well, was it, was it drawn because it was beautiful? Or was it drawn because it would elicit a reaction from an adoring crowd? Style, or is it plain old sincerity? Does it even matter? And here's the problem with the S2. When you've excavated it from its box and you've stopped beaming at the box and you've, you've finished beaming at the pen as well and you remove the cap, you discover it's a bloody pain to write with. It's nothing to do with the nib. Reason one, you have this brutal step down from shaft to section. Uh, people who've watched a few of my videos will probably have gathered I am not someone who usually gives a stuff about this sort of thing, like, you know, a little bump hurting my fingers. But, no offense to anyone who, who um... But... Well, it's really sharp, this one, and really severe. <laughs> Uh, this particular, this particular step is a bit much for me. I would live with it, however. I'd live with it giddily and fancy free. In fact, were it not for reason two, the section, which is presently covered in ink because I've been waving the pen around <laughs> at you. But even when it's not covered in ink, it's so slippery. I almost Wondered whether they were trying to channel a, a koi carp or a fish. I feel like we're going to fall off it. More on that experience shortly. But first, I can't help but linger on the question of does it matter? Style or sincerity? That question led me to reread, for the first time in years, Alan Hollinghurst's Booker Prize winning novel, Line of Beauty. And this is set in the 1980s. Our protagonist, Nick Guest, is the permanent lodger in the eye-watering Kensington home of a university friend named Toby and his wildly pretentious, convivial but evil family. Toby's father, Gerald Fedden, is an, amb an ambitious conservative MP. I want to make your flesh creep. Whose desk had photos of both his wife, Rachel, and Margaret Thatcher in silver frames. Gerald is obsessed with becoming a cabinet minister by Christmas. And although he had not received the accolade of a spitting image puppet in his likeness yet, it was one of his main hopes for the new parliament. There was a painting by Guardi, a capriccio of Venice in a gilt Rococo frame. The little Gauguin landscape Lionel had given them hung opposite their bed, you know. Little this, little that, little, little bit of insurance. Bob's your uncle. The line of beauty, the OG, was what carved up Nick's various problems. He's, he's got a taste for all this gorgeous finery. I'm not really a snob said Nick, as if a small admission was the best kind of denial. I just love beautiful things. But he doesn't have much money of his own. That's the problem. Nick instead uses his alarmingly expansive knowledge of a capital A art to make a sort of cantilevered approach to the upper rungs of the social ladder. And Nick sort of fetishizes the elegant trappings of his hosts, of the elite in general. The elephants, the horses, the regalia, the trappings, ugh. As if they describe their character. Whereas in reality, he's kept around as a kind of accessory. He's become very attached to this family. Or possibly, is it their lifestyle? He's inserted himself into their lives to the point where he saw himself showing the house to a new friend as if it was really his own. And yet, Gerald, the MP, can only just bring himself to call Nick part of, part of the household, not family household. It's the 1980s and Nick is also gay. His hosts are ostensibly very cool with this, given the era and their backgrounds and their politics, but Nick, navigates both 
domestically and in public, as if he's on a tightrope. Outside, he observes the world of actually existing gayness with a vague snobbery and timidity. At home, he leaves himself wondering whether the brute reality of him getting a phone call from someone he's been dating on the landline was rather more than Gerald had ever imagined being asked to deal with. Nick's left second-guessing. Was the look on his host's face stern and disappointed? or merely abstracted, the frown of a broken train of thought. All that's pretty painful. But then you also have this young, confused guy preoccupied with aesthetically radiant images gathering in a golden future, just as the AIDS crisis hits. By this point, all his fine and noble aspirations have been sublimated into predictable robotic encounters with gorgeous youths and predictable robotic use of narcotics. He loved the scandalous idea of what he was doing more than the actual sensations. What matters more? The action or the reaction? The experience or the performance? Sometimes his memory of books he pretended to have read became almost as vivid as that of books he had read. I liked this novel more reading it this time around. I think when I originally read it, I just found Nick kind of loathsome in a straightforward way. I mean, he, he sounds like a nightmare, definitely, but who isn't in their 20s? But I had a lot more sympathy this time around. It's, it's kind of like he, he, Nick is living on the, the line of beauty this eye-catching signal of change. And that now feels to me a bit like that line that marks the edge of a precipice. And you don't know it's a precipice. And you're standing there all alone in a pitch dark night. That's how Nick seems to me. There's something horrifying and beautiful about that. And when I read the book this time, Nick's life seemed the same, horrifying and beautiful. But you know, I'm really only envious of one thing, and that is a surfer. I think it's the most beautiful thing to be a surfer oh, between the sky and the water would be, to me, the most wonderful thing. That all makes me less confused about the line of beauty. It's not a line of contrivance to manipulate the viewer. It's a line of suggestion, a snake-like flicker of an instinct of two compulsions, artist and observer, held in one unfolding movement. You freeze a moment in time and leave it to the viewer. And Nick gets there too. We, we see him go from finding his reassurance in remembering social triumphs he had had clever things he had said, to the very final words of the novel, stripped of his pretensions and presumptions and everything. And for just an instant, he sees his surroundings in the light of the moment. So beautiful. And that leads me very neatly onto the massive problem I have with the Moon Man S2. The Moon Man S2 cannot exist merely as an object, as a piece of art. So, the writing sample. Let's kick off by examining this much maligned step from shaft to section, which is indeed very, very sharp. I could use that to peel a potato or a carrot if I wanted to while away an hour or two. And what's strange about the sharp nature of this angle here, and it needs to be sharp, of course, in order to get this, this crisp connection with the cap cap band and maintain our elegant line of beauty. What's strange is this, the, the contrast between this, this sharpness here. Let's see, I could use it to, you could use it for your cuticles, crying out loud. The sharpness here and the oiliness, the oily, slippery quality of the section. Moon Man S2, and I'm writing with Ching Cho ink by pen bbs and the nib nib is good nib is not nib good nib is good I can i can manage a whole sentence but yeah it's strange because 
as with all things fountain pens, we're dealing with, with subtleties, really minute little gradations of sensation and how that affects the writing experience. But that's inevitable. You, your, your, your positioning, this precision instrument, quite intimately, really, in one of your precious hands. And, and you're using it to do quite delicate manoeuvres, careful operations with tiny little adjustments of pressure and your fingertips. It's careful of pressure. I, I, there was no thinking going on behind that, those, that writing there, as you'll probably see, as, as you may note from the, the terrible handwriting, for which I do apologize. It's not a bad nib at all, is the point I'm getting to, but already, I've written the words nib is good, careful of pressure, and terrible handwriting. And already I'm conscious, acutely conscious, of holding on to this sharp little thing because my fingers have slipped all the way down the section. Just, just, they've slid down, down, down the section over these, what do I want to call these? They're very wide threads. The threads are the perhaps in if the if the the step weren't so sharp, you'd notice the threads more. But no, the threads aren't actually that much of a problem. They're quite um, blunt threads, but because they're wide, I suppose maybe that was intentional. But and you hit this thing, so they've gone to all the trouble of putting a very nice Schmidt number five nib on the pen. And obviously they've gone to a lot of trouble in terms of the appearance. If we just had a, and I, I do understand why perhaps this is needed. If we just had a grippier section, if we just had, I don't know, some, some lovely rubberized surface or something, would that be a solution? That, it would be nice, but yes, just to appraise the nib on its own, you've got lovely ink flow. Endless ink flow, really. Plenty, 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 plenty. And well, it's strange that this ink is named Ching Chiu, given this color. It's a sort of dirty, dirty oxblood sort of color, isn't it? So in fact, the nib experience of writing with this pen is quite pleasant. Everything that's happening up here and traveling down, it's quite pleasant. It's nice to use. It, it's smooth. It's it's kind of luscious. It's 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 very pleasant. But the the sensations further up here, further up my fingers, it's just uncomfortable. I mean, it's not a comfortable pen to use over even well quite a short period of time. Let's do our panda pen pen club pa 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 panda pen pan pan gram. <laughs> Let's do our Panda Pen Club pangram and and I'll grit my teeth in order to let you see the, well, confusing nature of this beast. Lovely or lucky panda seeks, jinxed, zebra. For quick game. Oh, and yeah, like my fingers are slipping down the section already. Very frustrating of whist. I want this sentence to be over as quickly as possible. <laughs> Which is unlike me. <laughs> so, a funny one. A, a very pretty pen, 
a very nicely made pen. You can feel that particularly in the screwing and unscrewing here, which is just, it's like butter. Beautifully done. Here a little less so, but they've made, and they've thought to make the threads blunt, flat, wide, I suppose, to try and counteract the problem here. But why on earth they've not dealt with this slippery, slippery section, I don't know. Because it's a, it's a lovely but uh, problematically finished pen. Nonetheless, I'm still quite glad to own such a pretty and interesting little object. There's only one very good life, and that's the life that you know you want and you make it yourself. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to Panda Pen Club on YouTube, and hell, share it with your friends on social media. Thanks so much for watching, and see you next time. A quick word of warning for the uninitiated to this author's work. If you've been inspired and plan on reading the book, and I personally would wholeheartedly recommend you do, I feel I should, yeah, offer a word of warning. It gets into some pretty racy stuff that you may not have had cause to contemplate from quite those particular angles as yet. And it does so pretty early on and it continues to do so pretty much throughout. Uh, now, for some of you, that's probably all the encouragement you need. For others, maybe less so. So I thought I'd better mention it in case you were about to make a reckless purchase for a nine-year-old.